What are these? Well, they're children's toys, but they are primarily characters. Each one of these has a set of skills, a set of ways, and each one is known for something specific. It's an Decepticon! And for all these little guys here, that's just all right. Okay, how about these people? These are humans. Humans playing characters. And just like the characters represented by those toys, all their practices and priorities and their precision in their chosen field only exist in this flat 2D plane. And unless it's addressed on the screen, then it flat out doesn't exist. Then there's these cats. This is the most pervasive. You see, these are real people playing themselves, but in a heightened reality. They do and say the things that they think they should do to make this show entertaining. I have a right to fight for my life in this game as much as anyone else. And I have a right to extinguish it if I can. That plus the producers seeding conflict, introducing stress, and literally scripting the storylines, and of course editing the crap out of it. It makes moments happen that never actually happen. So, when these people exit the stage, we all assume and expect that the on-camera person also is who they really are. Tremendous. I'm almost trying to help you. And then, finally, on the scale, there is sports. Most specifically, NBA basketball. Mind you, we're not going down the road of the NBA is rigged or staged. That's not what we're doing today. Something different. But make no mistake, this is a stage. This court. But unlike each of those previous scenarios, not everyone is a willing participant, and it's not always a person's choice as to which character they play. All right, let's change the channel on this for a second. I'm a fan of fast moves, so I'm a fan of Bill Cartwright. I love to watch a great all-around player. By the way, Jenna, this is Durant, because you've talked about how he's annoying you, like what is he trying to be? Going into this season, Durant had been ejected twice in his career. He's clearly trying to be someone, portray someone, act a certain way, carry a chip on his shoulder where there's no, it's unnecessary to carry it. There's something that he is living with or holding onto that for whatever reason is manifesting itself into this really odd and peculiar behavior. And I say this all the time, if you are just following basketball for the first time this offseason, this is one of the bad guys of the NBA. You don't know this guy is one of the darling of the NBA at all, and everything keeps getting worse for him. More behavior begets more behavior begets weirder behavior. Yeah, I, I like Kevin Durant. Don't like him as much because it seems like uh, I know more about him now than I used to. Didn't you used to smoke crack? I tell you, these people, they sit in that chair and they just forget who they are. I question the guy's integrity. But on to our main topic. Let's get going. Today's word is garbage. Mr. Robinson doesn't like garbage in his shoes. But on to our main topic. Let's get going. Bill Cartwright, Michael Jordan, thank the fans. We just want to thank you for coming out every night and supporting us. When this man is done with you, you will either respect him or well, you might end up on the ground. And with your support, we'll be right back here again next year. This is James Wilkins, William What's happening? Cartwright. Knows what his job is, his role is, goes out and does it. Also known in circles as Mr. Bill, Teach, Dollar Bill, Billy Idol. One more. Bill Cartwright is an accomplished NBA professional. But the disrespect for this man's career, simply being boiled down to a Jordan is a savage SOB story, is nuts to me. And again, the worst offense of all is it's just lazy. But it's not an isolated scenario here. Lazy coverage, lazy reporting, lazy stories. All right. The Converse weapon, that's to shoot, that's magic to do what he was born to do. It may be so, but that's not all. They let Isaiah play like he's 10 feet tall. Bang. You already know what you did for me. What? I walked away with the MVP. The Converse uh, weapon, the number one weapon in the NBA. Let's fast forward to 2017, where the abhorrent disrespect lands on our dear friend, Kevin Jeffrey Durant. You find Kevin Durant as a tough guy? Oh, no, 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 no. Let's be real here. Durant, come on, boy. You know you sound good at fight Tyson, Scott. KD was like, no, y'all hold me back. I'm gonna go this way. Would you for the fight him? 
Go on. This is where I told you where guys try to act like studio gangsters. But that skinny dude that you see that is Kevin Durant might not want to get in a fight with DeMarcus Cousins. I'm just saying. Actually, Kevin Durant, I'd be surprised if he's ever been in a fight. And everything keeps getting worse for him. More behavior begets more behavior begets weirder behavior. Boogie is 6'10", like 270. That's that's the general narrative everyone's saying is, uh, KD, you don't want this business. Worse at faking that he wants to fight than he actually is at fighting. Well, that's like that Twitter account. But like, you're right. <laughs> when you see these characters, like this guy, Hold me back, worse. Worse. And this lady right here. At least fake it, dude. Get out there and fake. He doesn't fake it. Talking about a player as if they're not scared of them, as if they could beat his ass. Now I'm ready to go. Okay, Jenna, this Let's is the one. That's when you know folks have gotten way too comfortable. Hey, Everything you, about him has been just see, annoying see, this season. See, after this little incident here. Watch it here. Between Watch Kevin Durant it. and Demarcus Cousins. Uh, they're both gone. Yep. Uh, the almost unanimous reaction this is, this is immediately man. sounded my perception he's alarm. They both get the second team. Folks seem to believe that KD versus Demarcus Cousins is not a thing. Folks seem to believe that KD really doesn't want any part of this. And he shouldn't. Let's be real. Let's be real. Why did Marcus Cousins swallow your shit? Wait, what? Swallow, what? Swallow. Oh. Well, just watch this. Katie got real, real tough the moment, the moment Draymond, he's like, okay, now Draymond's here. Okay, now I'm ready to go. Okay, Jenna, this Let's is the go. One. So, so much talking, and he's so dearly confident to mock a man twice his size. If DeMarcus wanted to talk that talk, that's one thing. But the sheer nerve of this mini man to run his little mouth and rear up in his high adjustable chair to talk more of his brazen shit. You see, Nick is the definition of a studio gangster. Because Nick doesn't get near the games. He doesn't do the sideline or halftime show. So he's detached from the actual game and the actual humans, which has led him to a land of overconfidence and pure oblivious hubris. Annoying, huh? The problem is folks really act like they know DeMarcus Cousins, like they know him personally. Honestly, if I hear someone like Bill Simmons refer to him as Boogie, Boogie, like he gave him the damn nickname. Boogie Cousins is here. We're not gonna call you DeMarcus, I'm just calling you Boogie. Like he was there when they came up with the nickname. I might have to mail this guy some white powdery substance. Really? Okay, Boogie. 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 And I don't know, I just feel the over familiarity in people when they toss around names is always a tad disrespectful. Anyway, they also just assume that since he's a big, scary, scowling black man, apparently he's got great hands. Apparently he's a goddamn MMA star in the raw, by default. That all he needs is a dark alley and he'd beat literally anybody's ass. That's a weird spectator fantasy that folks love to project onto our athletes. But what is it based on? Is it because he gets mad? Because he yells at refs? That he has that superior Kendrick Perkins scowl? Is it because folks see him as crazy or emotional or uncontrollable? Where he might just throw caution to the wind and say F it and start boxing? Like a pre-Meta World Peace Ron Artest? Nah, that's not him. To Marcus Cousins, this man has cried more on camera than he's actually fought. Every family in this, in this city matters to me. Every soul in this city matters to me. So it, everything's the same. I'm just, I'm the king of uniform anymore. Which is okay because, you know, the love is still here. Right? It's still going on. Thank you. So, who is this guy really? It's easy to find out. So let's look at his past. Let's find proof in the pudding. It doesn't take much research, and after reading a now-defunct Grantland article, another sacrificial lamb on the altar of Bill Simmons' ego, it seems that DeMarcus Cousins growing up, the man, the kid, DeMarcus Cousins, was a sensitive, reactive kid who was constantly concerned about folks taking advantage of him, being misunderstood, pretending to be something and turning out to be another. He wore his emotions on his sleeve, as they say, and battled with the idea that he was basically grown man size at the age of 15. And that drastically changes how the world interacts with you. Even family members said he didn't have a regular growing up experience. He didn't get to do all the regular high school, adolescence, growing up stuff. He didn't even date much. It was all basketball. And I'll tell you, a young man around nothing but older men is toxic. And in terms of altercations, on record is one altercation he had with a bus driver. And his high school suspended him for the second half of his sophomore season because of it. And that incident defined him in the eyes of a lot of people in the media. Like when Jameis Wilson stole that crab. Listen, folks make a lot of mistakes. I'm 
thankful that my college days were not trailed by a TMZ camera. But what's funny is that Cousins has always claimed that he was acting in self-defense on that bus. And if his general life experience is something to build off of, there's a chance that this 16-year-old was faced to deal with a real grown man and the real grown man aggression. Just because Cousins looked like a grown ass man on the outside. You're not getting the breaks. You're not getting the same consideration from men if you look like a grown ass man. And he obviously couldn't deal with all this. And he even said between having the top national ranking and his age, he felt like he had a big fat target on his back. In many cases, opposing players and coaches tried to make their bones by taking shots at him, punking him, getting him frustrated. That's his eternal battle. To this day, he's had to learn to take it and not lash out, not fight, not yell. So occasionally he does, and he gets pinned as this aggressive, violent man that will beat anybody's ass. Is that good? Is that a good persona? Zach Randolph sure thinks he is. Zach Randolph, when he said, in my neighborhood, the bullies get bullied, was under the impression that DeMarcus Cousin is that guy. It's clear that this man is dealing with a staggered life experience and clearly doesn't want to take anyone's sh but that's never manifested itself into DeMarcus, the human fight knight. If anything, he cares too much. He's not cold and detached from human connections and feelings to the point where he could just punch people in the face. He's painfully attached to his emotions. And the people closest to him know that. Why do you think he's so kind of misunderstood or polarizing as a player? Uh, I think just because he's, for one, he's already bigger than everybody. He looks like a bully. But, um... He just comes with the mindset of he just plays with intensity. Like, he don't back down from anybody. He brings with, plays with so much emotions. And I think uh, I mean, he gets, sometimes he's don't get the benefit of the doubt and it goes the wrong way. And just like a reputation. I mean, when you get a bad reputation, everybody keep that and hold that towards you. And hopefully you can keep trying to trying to uh, change it around. And he's a great person. I mean, everybody don't see that unless you're really around him. Uh, he's one of those people that... Uh, it's all about first impressions. If you don't give him a first impression, it's not well, you probably won't talk to him ever again. So this down to brawl, don't give a f perception of him is just a load of wishful, stereotypical thinking. It really is. And this point here, the one I'm about to make is infinitely important. The only punching DeMarcus has ever done on an NBA court the only beating up he's credited with is when he beat the crap out of that chair. Well, we've seen him go ballistic and get upset in situations like this because Cousins now has only played 11 minutes. Well, he got a tee because he just punched the chair. Yep. Otherwise, it's just the same old pushing and bumping that everyone else does. He doesn't even square up, really. I mean, look at these fight mixes on YouTube. He doesn't even pretend to get in a fighting stance. He pushes and shoves, which literally every player ever has done, and then watch him. He either walks away or stands there, arms down, basically trying to hear what the person is saying and letting them know what he thinks. These aren't fights. These are heated conversations. And before they can hold him back, he usually starts storming off in a different direction. And then those pre-programmed participants go into hold me back mode. He's not participating in the ruse but he can't seem to escape it. He's not a violent thug growing up in the streets, selling crack just to get by. He's just an emotional guy. DeMarcus Cousins is an emotional lesbian. <laughs> He's just had a lot of examples of people turning on him, betraying him. It's ridiculous. It's obvious what's being done out here. It's on a nightly basis. I hope the world can see now what's really going on out here, because it's getting ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. And this city done put me through so much. I had to stay loyal to it the whole time. Hey, I just want to know how you're going to stop God's man. God give his hardest battles to the strong souls. The marathon continues. I'm out. And like any other honorable man, he just doesn't want you to bring his family into it. That's some real f***ing issues. Don't ever mention my brother again. You don't know my f***ing brother. I see this as all selective perception. And here's an example. One day in his rookie season, after a close loss to OKC, DeMarcus was clearly not happy, especially with how the final play went. And he directed his outrage towards the inbounder and 10th man, Dante Green, who didn't pass him the ball. This disagreement led to an altercation in the locker room, which led to a team issued suspension, a suspension that was executed by pulling him off the team plane while it was on the tarmac as it was just about to leave Phoenix. They pulled him off the plane, bags and all, and left him. And they did this way by choice. What the fuck is that? That's cold. That's embarrassing. He had his bags packed and everything. 
I mean, damn, they took him off the plane like he's a terrorist or something, like he was shouting Allah Akbar. Here, a few quick notes here. No, they didn't suspend Dante Green, though, who physically participated in the altercation, and by that, they showed zero deference towards their star and future of the franchise for a simple rookie mistake. Then, even worse, team leadership publicly called DeMarcus out for what happened in the confines of the locker room. And then the dipshit coach, in an interview with the local paper, went out of his way to reveal other incidents DeMarcus had been in. Mind you, these incidents were also behind closed doors, the type of thing where functional NBA teams usually avoid talking about. And here's your kicker. Every scenario, every incident was about basketball. It was all about the game for DeMarcus. Can nobody see that he's just not an angry person in general, in need of discipline? He was in need of a team, a coach, a GM, that knew what they were doing. And yes, he should have been pissed that he didn't get the ball for the last shot. And yes, he should have yelled at the coach that other time. As the star and the focus of the franchise, when you're barely a 20-win team with a roster that's not that bad, it is his role to get answers or be the catalyst for some change. And apparently he was, because the very next year, seven games into the season, Coach Paul Westfall was fired. Look, every incident he has is about the game. He just simply thinks he's right. But as a result, coach after coach, GM and team officials show that they were never going to give him a chance or even a voice, as they reveal themselves as snakes. And just like the article said, DeMarcus loves you, he's gonna love you. But if he's upset about something, you're gonna see it. Because when it comes to basketball, DeMarcus isn't looking for a fight. He's just weeding out the fakes. We all know the second he finds his way to a winning team, all this passion towards the game, the stuff that's getting him in trouble, is gonna start getting framed in a positive light. That's good for the team. But until then, this partial perspective on his character is a distraction and a problem. And these desk jerks just slurp it all up. And to prove my simple point even further, here's another story. Back in college, somehow, DeMarcus Cousins' phone number got leaked to a whole bunch of Mississippi State fans. And what do you think a whole bunch of garbage can Mississippians did with that number? Well, exactly what you think. They sent him a ton of vulgar and racist text messages. And some of them even had the audacity to call the number and leave the same sentiment on his voicemail. Now, in the ESPN article written by Earman Brennan, Earman. Earman continues, explaining how one would predict that DeMarcus Cousins would probably handle this situation poorly. And then he goes on to mention Cousins' on-court arguments with refs and disagreements with players, extrapolating that DeMarcus should almost certainly explode with anger as a result of this racist deluge. But to Earman's surprise, DeMarcus doesn't. To everyone's surprise, he not only takes it in stride, but he even answers the phone occasionally to talk to those whack jobs, as Earman puts it. The article even recounts DeMarcus was laughing the whole thing off to reporters, as if he doesn't seem to take this nonsense personally. Why is this surprising? Good Lord Jesus Christ, he's not a monster. He's not a pillaging barbarian. He's played basketball his entire life. He intentionally chose not to participate in a series of adolescent experiences, weighty moments in growing up, to dedicate himself to basketball. So he clearly takes basketball stuff directly to the heart, especially when folks continue to try and take it away from him or make basketball a toxic experience. They keep saying he needs discipline. Come on guys, discipline. Discipline is showing up to practice all those years in his teens and not skipping to pursue other things. So you get these moments where the talking shitbags in a cascading chorus reinforce this. That KD wants none of this man, because this man will kill him. And it's coming out of a bunch of frail, pasty, malnutrition, vitamin D deficient, dog mouth kissing sports commentator who clearly pop boners at the sight of a traditionally sized man with aggression in his eyes. Now let's move on to the KD side of this. Why do folks doubt him? Is it because he spent a couple years being manicured as a cupcake? Is it simply because he's wiry, thin, not a lot of meat on his bones? Well, let's just start here. NBA fights. Fights in general are not about how 
fat you are. It's about speed and accuracy. Not sure, if these two got in a situation where they both had one free shot at each other, I'm going with Demarcus. But in a quick brawl, where there's actual punches thrown, there's nothing telling me here that KD can't land one and then adjust or duck. There. And most importantly, I really want to dispel this, that thin guys get their asses beat. That thin guys, by default, are going to lose the fight. And even more specifically, I want to dispel that within the context of the NBA. Some of the worst beatdowns or fastest hands have come from relatively thin big men, and not the slow, lumbering ones who'd probably rather just sit on their opponent. So now, how about we look at a few examples? Case number one, my man Manute. Mm, look at Manute. You see that roundhouse? The distance he kept from him and walks away. Bang! Case number two. The Chief, Robert Parrish. Watch him. Watch him. Bam! Ooh, he pounded down on him like it was whack-a-mole. Oh, you gotta check on him. Case number three. The man that should have been Ralph Sampson. This is one of my favorites here. Here he is. Watch this man. He's being held. Bam! Sit down. Watch that again. Find him. There he is. Oh! He caught him on the back of the head, taking the whole team on, gets up. They're fighting too. It's those long arms and that high velocity little resistance are good at knocking people the fuck out. Here's a quick little fun one. This Danny Age one is impressive. He's not thin, but he's short and white. And I just love the technique. He takes down the biggest guy, Tree Rollins. Watch this. It's just technique, man. Taking those MMA classes, he's got technique. Danny Ainge can take down Tree Rollins. I think Kevin Durant has a slim chance against DeMarcus Cousins. Quick side note on NBA fights. You know what I've noticed in these old clips is that they sure went into the stands a lot. There were a lot of altercations with fans and players, like actual fighting. I mean, People try to mark that Malice in the Palace as the worst, darkest day in NBA history, but fans were getting knocked out plenty of years before that. Case number nine, or whatever, Marcus Camby. Marcus was a real one, and for the majority of his career, he was a damn skinny dude that never stopped him. Also, nobody talks shit about him like he was some delicate-ass flower bound to break in half if somebody ever hit him. That was not the perception of Marcus. Here's some rapid fire ones from all over the board. Dikembe. In his era, he definitely was a skinnier center than most. And though he wasn't a fighter per se, he never backed down. I don't think anybody ever said, watch out Dikembe, you don't want none of this. I mean, sure, Shaq dominated him in the post and knocked him around, but we never thought Dikembe was scared of him, or should be scared. Ah, Reggie. We gotta, come on, we gotta add Reggie. We have to include him. Reggie was clearly 50 pounds lighter than anyone he ever met, and his biggest muscles were probably in his elbows. But when he went up against those strong twos and threes, he was the instigator. He talked some serious trash, and he would follow it up physically, fighting, wrestling. Reggie and Kobe go spilling into the first row. But this is what I don't understand. Why does that bag of bones get all the credit, and the other bag of bones get no credit? Because Reggie's attitude superseded his physique. He was a shit talker from day one and always got in people's faces. So we bought into that character. He made us folks believe it was all real. Kevin Durant, although he was a low key shit talker back in OKC. Well, obviously, it's a tough night. Uh, Curry's shooting better, but he also came up with a big steal in the fourth. Do you think that he's underrated as a defender? Uh, I mean, my. Uh... Getting steals, uh, I don't know if that's just, uh, that's a part of playing defense, but, um, you know, he's pretty good, but he, he guards, he doesn't guard the best point guards. Wasn't playing the bad guy role, or the instigator role. So we continue to drag a big garbage bag of goodwill and a humble mama's boy imagery. You made us believe, you kept us off the street, put clothes on our backs, food on the table, you went to sleep hungry, you sacrificed for us. You the real MVP. So we drag that into his fighting, and that's not gonna look good for him. All right, there's one more person I have to mention. 
because he's the Magellan of the Hold Me Back era. He's the Stanislavski of faux outrage. He's the Napoleon of skinny people's complex. It's Kevin Garnett. But I'm gonna do an entire video on him, so I'm not gonna step on my own toes. Let's keep it moving. Dennis, you're just a little bit too tight, man. You need to loosen up. For me? Be provocative. Don't be so conservative. Shake things up. Be shocking. Let your hair down. Please, lay off the hair, okay? Over the top, man. Be an individual. So what do you want me to do? Well, you can start by eating your pizza the wrong way. Crust first. That's weird, man. That's too weird. Now these days, we all know that real life fights in the NBA are non-existent, but that doesn't mean that the on-court fakery is useless. People need to just stop shitting on the Hold Me Back era. I mean, we pay to see fake stuff all the time. We go to the movies, we pay to witness danger and violence that was never dangerous nor violent. When you go to see Hamilton, you expect to see that kid get shot in the duel, and then you also expect to shake that same kid's hand post-show in the hallway. The WWE has made a fortune off of fake aggression. If we don't get these Jets vs. Sharks moment, how do we develop the good guys and the bad guy storylines? The players in the black hat develop their characters and reinforce their brand, toughness, and scrappiness in these moments. I mean, why do you think Patrick Beverly is revered as a defensive force? Because he uses all the tools in the tool bag, including all that fake aggression and posturing the NBA makes available for the scene. Another reason it's important is because we can't hear the players. If this is a stage show, it's a pretty crappy one. It's handicapped, because the folks in the stands, and for most of the time, the viewers, who can't hear the lines, the trash talk, and all the typical and subtle cues that things are getting heated. I mean, the trash talk is important, so important to the storyline. How often do we hear these wonderful stories 30 years later about the trash talk that was going on in those particular moments? <laughs> in Washington, and, I, and um, he's a little older. I think, uh, you know, it, it was maybe four more years in his career, but you know, and uh, I, I follow him and I get, you know, get away with it, come back down. And uh, the next time, uh, you know, he's going off at the ref. He filed me, he filed me. And, and uh, I'm like, I ain't filing me. He over there crying. And the ref, he's like, uh, he looked at the ref, he's like, I scored 24,000 points or something. I scored 20,000 points right here in this position. You gonna tell me he ain't filing me? And the ref just shook. <laughs> and I, knew, I knew I was in trouble. So again, we need the miming, the big gestures. As viewers, we need this moment so it's clear what the emotions are down on the court. It's the same idea when you see someone like Steve Kerr break his clipboard. Bruce Lee would be proud. Or yell at the ref. He's out of the floor. Get ejected. And he's gone. Wow. All for the emotion and the show. Coaches do this deliberately to get their team riled up. The Hold Me Back era is simply the full realization of the show. And he has something to say to Kenny Maurer on his way out. But our announcers know that every detail is crucial to the story. So you may notice that when players are flapping their jaws or arguing, the announcers take on a role of a kind of interpreter, narrating or more accurately paraphrasing the scene. And what they say it definitely makes sense but they do take quite a lot of liberty, as they even cross into mind reading occasionally, telling us what the players are actually thinking. And we hear this all the time. Here's an inconspicuous one. Yeah, that might be what Isaiah was thinking, and yes, that is what Magic wanted, but in what world does a third party have complete control to disseminate to the masses what other people are thinking? I'm just glad the law doesn't work that way, as hard as they try. Again, good ones almost always lay out a plausible scenario. Here's another one. Oh, there we go, he's talking to Cantor, and Cantor needs to be quiet because you just got on this train last year. That, that's what I mean, Cantor doesn't know how to take up for Westbrook. You sit on the side and, and you be quiet. As Adams just patted him and said, be quiet. Yes, Cantor was talking mess, and I do think Adams is telling Cantor to shut the hell up. But we really don't know. Maybe he's thinking, yeah, man, I got your back. But the truth is, he actually didn't say anything. The man never opened his mouth. But the announcers understand that the conversation and the inner monologues are extremely important to the overall story. So filling in those blank spots with absolutes will draw a viewer in deeper letting us feel like we know a little secret, like we really know these guys. And it just gets the audience hyped, especially as things escalate. Now, what I also enjoy is seeing what people actually do in those rare instances when there's nobody to hold you back. Obviously, pushing is an option, aggressive ass slapping is an option, but I've become a fan of the Ram style battle. You know, the forehead to forehead smush off. This is dramatic. You can see the aggression, but you can also see the restraint. I mean, it's so strange. 
and intimate. It's basically the best you're gonna get these days. Look at that brain smush with the ref. He just got ejected. Best part of this one is that the referee seemed to be the one activating the forehead connection. Well, Courtney walked into him. Why is the official walking towards the player? He, he walked into him. Now back in the dark ages, you didn't get all that forehead to forehead stuff. What you did get was people going for each other's neck, which made for a great photo like this. The second greatest NBA photo of all time. The greatest one being this one, of course. Okay. And unlike the head-to-head, -head, the neck, the neck stuff carries a connotation of death. I mean, really, I think it's impossible to choke someone a little without thinking, man, I could kill this person right now. It's like if you had a knife and you just stab someone a little bit. You're thinking about what would happen if you stabbed them more, right? Right. But now, really, this encounter is legendary, and it may deserve a video of its own, because the next phase after this Death tease was a legitimate jumping as Charles Barkley actually held Larry Bird's arms, allowing the doctor to perform a non elective outpatient reconstructive procedure on Larry Bird's face. It was kind of scary, actually. About Dr. J and Larry Bird got to fight. And what happens is you always just grab the guy closest to you. So I, ha I happen to be standing behind Larry Bird, so I grabbed Larry Bird. And Dr. J just bow, 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 just laid him out. <laughs> Doc was smooth. Oh, can, can you give, can you give me the Doc. sound effect one more time? Hey, hey <laughs> Doc is doing rock and rock and roll. I get fine and suspended. I'm like, why? They're like, I, I said, I tried to break up the fight. They said that I was holding Larry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chuck. I don't buy it. It's a dirty move, and that's definitely who you were, and it was a thing. Folks holding people back so they could get socked by another player was a classic move, and it was made popular by this guy, everybody's favorite smiling jerk, Isaiah Thomas, and the cheap shot Pistons. I mean, the bad boy Pistons. Though Isaiah was not always successful with this move, and sometimes it went comically wrong. Watch this. Bird just kinda punked him there. <laughs> <laughs> and then Isaiah takes that shot at his chest. Jeez, it's, it's not working. But this does make Barkley's hold a little more impressive. I know he's bigger, but it is against Bird. And Bird was, I guess, a tank. Because after this, Bird just got up and walked away. Like he didn't just get punched eight times directly in the face. Which means Bird is either that guy from that Black Mirror episode who enjoys pain, or Dr. J can't punch worth shit. Which proves my point that I haven't even made yet. See, the other thing I'm gonna miss about this era, well, I, I wasn't really there to see it, but I saw it a lot of my old basketball VHS tapes. It's the middle-aged, business and business casually dressed white guys getting their minds blown. <laughs> Don't see a lot of that these days. I'll do it. I say it with the pill. Check it out. AJD Cap Company introduces official NBA signature caps. Okay, Dominique's too handsome. No problem. Quality, one size fits all wool caps with your favorite NBA team's colors and logo. Bird's three-pointer. No sweat. And your favorite NBA player's name, number, and signature. Take it from me, Dick Stockton. Feel like a superstar. And then there's Bill Catfight. Cartwright. I'm sorry, that was a spell check. We need to bust another MJ story. It's buried in here, I know. About our man, Bill Cartwright. Why? Because of course, if Michael Jordan is involved, there's a good chance there's more to the story than we've been told. Yep. Okay, Bill Cartwright on his own is an NBA legend. Number one, because he won a bunch of rings with Jordan and the Bulls as a starting center. He was a great leader and he's got that weird ass shot that makes him memorable. But as time moves on, the thing I see floating around his name most, the 10,000 pound Marmaduke duct taped to his legacy's ankle, is this tail. Admittedly, it's not as outlandish or egregious as the Muggsy Bogues one. He didn't end his career with three words, but it is a story that digs at the reputation of a player only to build up the myth of Jordan. Here's how it goes on every single website. Jordan bullying. Bill Cartwright. Jordan was so unhappy with the Bulls organization, so when they brought Bill Cartwright to town, he made sure the front office was aware. MJ even nicknamed him Medical Bill, I guess on account of his injuries, his knee, I guess, and his age, and intentionally threw terrible passes his way in practice to make him look bad. 
Well, how succinct is that? Quick obvious note here, how selfish is that? Instead of figuring out how to work with this dude, MJ deliberately made his passes more difficult to catch. Yeah, sure, all about winning, okay. Okay. Duh, don't listen to a mic. It's all about you and me. Now this does sound like some MJ sh and as a result, Bill is painted as this feeble old man who is taking this abuse and doesn't stand a chance against the all-time bully. And on top of that, he can't even catch a god blessed pass. What a loser. If it's true, why is this man even playing? Why is he a starting center on an all-time great team? I'm so confused. And again, nowhere in the tale does it claim that these insults ruined him, but it does leave a clear impression of Mr. Cartwright in our heads, weak and useless, and in no way a threat to anybody. But then why did Phil Jackson say that he's one of the hardest working men in the NBA he's ever seen? Why did the rest of the team refer to him as Teach and not Medical Bill? Because obviously there's more to the story. There's always more to the story. That's why I, we do this little dance here. So let's get some background on Bill. Bill Cartwright, in this era, in this all-out era, was holding his own just fine. He actually had a reputation for knocking folks the f out. He had these really sharp elbows. A cheap hit on Cartwright and absolutely no call down there. And he would just dunk all over people. Point draft. Good pass. Wilkins for Cartwright. And if you went up against him in the lane, there was a good chance you were going to end up on the ground. No foul. He was a tough, hardworking, smart leader of men. And let's just go back to this Rodman clip again. And let's take a look at this particular altercation. Look how he handles this little out of control kid. This is a G move. This guy clearly knows what he's doing. I don't know if he was planning on putting him to sleep with an uppercut, or maybe even a knee to the face, MMA style. But either way, this is a man who knows what he's doing. So we need to recategorize where we file Bill in our brains. And then Bill grabs him in a headlock. And, and to start doing that, let's get the whole Jordan Cartwright story. Here's a few choice passages from the infamous book, The Jordan Rules, from 1991. On June 27th, the night Bill Cartwright was traded to the Bulls for Charles Oakley, he didn't anticipate the problems that would develop between him and Jordan. Jordan never cared much for Cartwright's play and wondered immediately who would be his policeman now. Not with a bumbling Cartwright, and Horace Grant wasn't ready for primetime just yet, who would take Oakley's place in the starting lineup? The big question was Cartwright's knee. Cartwright always said he was ready to go. You couldn't even get Cartwright out of practice because he said he needed to keep conditioned for the games. But by playoff time in 1990, Cartwright's knee was so wrecked he couldn't sit in a car for more than a few minutes with his knee bent. On the team buses to game, he had to lie flat on his seat, but he never talked to anyone or complained about it. He just went out and played. Jordan never saw any of that in Cartwright, who Phil Jackson said works harder than any player I've ever come across, including Michael. Cartwright once summed up his philosophy of the game by saying, you just play until there's no game left in your uniform. Quick interjection here, this is getting ridiculous. This guy sounds like the type of guy Jordan would admire. He works extremely hard, he doesn't complain, he shows up to practice, he's willing to do whatever. But the MJ who appreciates that type of stuff isn't a real person. That person doesn't exist. Petty Jordan is real. Petty Jordan. Meanwhile, Jordan, during practice, would dart into the lane and shoot Cartwright a no-look pass. Invariably, it would bounce off of Cartwright's hand and go out of bounds. He's causing me too many turnovers, Jordan said to reporters, always making sure Cartwright could hear him. God, what a dick. Sometimes his passing would be just a little too hard, and they would bounce out of bounds off Cartwright. And Jordan would shake his head and look towards the then-coach Doug Collins disgustedly, stretching his arms out, palms up in the air, all dramatic, as if saying, what more can I do? But Cartwright refused to back down down. And in the other parallel universe, the coaches would always say that if you want to know how to get things done, you watch Bill Cartwright. That's Coach Jackson. He went on to say he's got the best footwork on the team. Yeah, including Jordan. Everyone calls him Teach. But Phil Jackson says, I don't think I ever heard Michael call him that though. And it's not likely because Jordan felt Cartwright couldn't score a basket in an empty gym. Jordan liked to belittle Cartwright in the locker room. He'd imitate Cartwright's unorthodox shooting style with wild, exaggerated moves that left many of his teammates trying to stifle laughter when Cartwright was nearby. Cartwright would just look away and blame immaturity. But Jordan went one step too far that first season. He was angry over the Bulls' slow start and had already gone to Jerry Krause during the Western trip in November to ask that he make some trades. 
I need help, he told Krause. Krause explained the Bulls had salary cap problems, which Jordan neither understood or cared about, so he made some decisions. One was that he would have to do just that much more himself, and he couldn't do that having Cartwright fouling things up, especially late in games. So he told Horace Grant, Sam Vincent, and Scottie Pippen, the three players who were usually on the floor at the end of games with him, that they were not to pass Cartwright the ball in the last four minutes of the game. If you do that, Jordan said, you'll never get the ball from me. Who did? I mean, how God bless it often do we hear about how the greats are great because they make their teammates better all the time. Dude, MJ was not into that. I mean, really, you wonder what they could have been if MJ knew how to really get the best out of his teammates, you know, not berate them and hit them, a little more carrot, a little less stick. I mean, I'm sure somebody will say that it clearly worked, but I'll say, well, maybe instead of 72 and 10, you're looking at 79 and three, and maybe an undefeated run in the playoffs. Listen, you can always get better. Okay, where am I? Ah, yes. Back in the locker room, eventually word got back to Bill, what MJ was saying. And he didn't do or say anything to anybody until late that season when he told Jordan that he needed to talk. There was little small talk exchange, Cartwright. I don't like the things I've heard you say about me. Jordan stared at him. Cartwright, if I ever hear again that you're telling guys not to pass me the ball, Cartwright continued, you will never play basketball again. Damn, Cartwright. But as Cartwright began to move better after surgery following the 89-90 season, Jordan began to accept him more. Oh, surprisingly. Jackson had offered Jordan a piece of advice. For as much as Jackson liked Cartwright, he realized one problem was that Jordan was too quick and too good as an athlete to play easily with Cartwright. Uh, I know you hate that old man, but just listen. So he said, when you pass him the ball, Jackson told Jordan, throw it at his nose. He'll catch it then. Okay, so throw a pass that he can catch. Jackson also named Cartwright co-captain. Mike, I need to show everybody that I'm actually in charge here. So, Bill's co-captain. Take that, Mike. But it didn't just end well. Mike continued to ice him out of the offense. Cartwright rarely grew angry like the younger players. He was just sad. Cartwright said, Michael's the greatest athlete I've ever seen. Maybe the greatest athlete ever to play any sport. He can do whatever he wants but he's just not a basketball player. Oh, Cartwright. 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 Also, let me just hit this point again. How lazy is Jordan with his trash talk? He calls Muggsy a midget. He calls a 40-year-old man with a knee problem medical bill. Jordan's ego or it or whatever it is that makes you say what's on your brain is a pure adolescent uncreative one. I mean, you know, between this story and that one with the older Robert Parrish joining the Bulls, where he basically told Jordan, don't talk that shit to me. I don't play your games because I've been around the league and I'll beat your ass. It seems to me that Jordan spent his time bullying short guys, white guys, white guys, rookies, mentally weak. But when it came to old school big men like Bill and Robert, Jordan, as the article says, ended up looking the other way eventually. Okay, back to KD. The point is, do your own research and don't just assume shit. Just because these idiots are more scared of DeMarcus than they are of Kevin because they have fantasies about getting slapped by a seven footer. Just because someone is bigger, madder, doesn't make them a better brawler or even a fighter to begin with. And for this, all we need to do is show one example. Shaquille O'Neal, a fat guy who can't fight. I think this is all we need to bust this perception wide open. Shaq, the biggest and self-identified most dominant, and he still couldn't fight for shit. His punches had about as much accuracy as his free throw percentage. But if I've proven anything in this video, it's that we can't be certain of any potential fight in the NBA because the fact is, nobody in the NBA can fight. Look at this depressing ass fight. Come on, Scotty. They look like they're five years old. What are they doing? <laughs> and the only person who's getting hit here is the ref. 
After going through all this, after looking through a shit ton of NBA fight clips, juxtaposed with research on a Jordan story, and a million other thoughts, I'm more certain than ever. How we view and define our players is 90% subjective and brutally selective at that. Nobody stands on their actual merits. It's never truly an unbiased, independent analysis, and it's 100% based on relativity, proximity, and gravity. All our featured characters today have been forcefully portrayed in a one-dimensional world, even though there are actual accounts of who they really are out there. But the dangerous part about today's game specifically, the difference between being a character back then and being one now, is that you used to be able to escape it. When these players were off the court, they got to be multi-dimensional millionaires. Jordan could run off and play golf and gamble the night before game. Magic could leave his family-friendly, wholesome good guy image on the court and cheat on his wife and participate in a 10-person orgy and that didn't affect the on-court character. But now we never let a person go. A player cannot ever step out of their character. Players today are truly haunted by this TV character. There's so many talking dummies saying the same thing non-stop, literally 24 hours a day. And there are too many irrationally obsessive fans who invade their feeds to address them like they know them and treating them as if that character they know is who they really are. We whittle them down, and box them in until they are really a smushed flat and nothing beyond that threshold matters. And in the end, when you refuse to consider the whole person, the people become characters. And we believe in these characters like it's the God honest truth. And the perception of them takes over reality. This isn't a game. I'm not playing games. Who will succeed? Who will fail? And who will be President of the United States? And that ain't never good. Thanks for watching. You did it. You win. Now, good day, sir. Good day. You stole fizzy lifting drink. And like always, everything evergreen, remember Minute, and I will see you at 4 a.m. outside your window. Because this.